So we are about halfway through this prevent plant and it's it's been a really prevent plant webinar series has been really good um, i'm glad we're doing it because it's giving us a lot of ideas um, we have a couple more remaining and we do post all this information on the ndsu soil health webpage. we have a prevent plant tab that um, or button that you can push from the home page to take you to all the information we've been posting uh, so that's a good resource if there's something you need to go back and listen to or um, or get information that you need to get um, but you know, I think I think when it comes down to to using cover crops on prevent plant, one of the most important things is to pick your goal, identify what your goal is. And a lot of cases, we know on prevent plants, it's going to be to manage water. But at the same time, you're managing water, you may want to do things like break compaction or catch nitrogen or um, build nitrogen in the soil, um, improve the seed bed, obviously reduce erosion, manage weeds. Um, so identifying those goals is really helpful to. Um, to picking the mixes that you're gonna use and how you're gonna manage those cover crop mixes. Um, when you pick your mix, I just have kind of some tips on things that we've been learning and seeing. Um, I pick most of my mixes based on the root structure because I like to think about, do I need something deep rooted, shallow rooted, fibrous roots, um, you know, thick roots that can break up compaction, but you know, really fibrous roots are also very good for, for repairing uh, ruts and compaction. Um, but, but really thinking about what you want to do in that soil and you can pick based on the root structure um, and also the above ground biomass. What are you comfortable having in your field uh, by the time we go into winter? Uh, one tip is that if you have um, canola in rotation, uh, do not use brassicas like rapeseed, turnips, or radish because of, they can be um, hosts for club root. Um, so just make sure you're aware of that. And, and there are also other cover crops that are hosts for things like soybean cyst nematode. And those, you, we have a list of the, those different species on the Prevent Plant webpage. So you can check it out. It's in a table format and it's easy to, to understand. So if you have really bad SCN problems, make sure you're avoiding those cover crop species, which are hosts. Um, same with if, if you are concerned about club root, which it sounds like you should be in the Northeast corner if you're growing canola, make sure you stay away from the radish, turnips, and rape seeds. Um, if you're going to look at, this is a PP field from last year uh, that was going to be grazed after September 1st when they pushed up the date. Um, I think we don't anticipate that happening this year just because uh, so much, so many states got crops planted. So probably November 1st will stick, will stay the date um, for grazing. But, um, but this is a really great field. It had peas, radish, turnips. It was meant to be grazed. Um, the, the le having a legume in there is also mycorrhizal. So for example, if, if, you're, if you're going to corn in 2021 on a field, don't do just radish and turnip. Um, neither of those cover crops have mycorrhizal associations. So that means that you can have phosphorus deficiency in your corn the following year. So adding in a grass or a legume could be really good to avoid issues with phosphorus the following year in corn. Um, so so I, mean, I know it seems like radish and turnip would be a great a great way to do it because you could broadcast a small seed but add something else into it because you'll have issues in, in your corn the following year. Um, as I've seen this this was not a PP field but it was a full season mix from last year um, on a high water table sandy soil it was also going to be grazed. Um, sorghum is an excellent uh, warm season option. Uh, Marisol really likes sorghum and sorghum Sudan uh, because of the high water use but you can see that sorghum does get very tall and there is a lot of biomass. Um, but it, it's a great way to use moisture. You can always terminate it if, it's, if you're getting uncomfortable with the growth. Uh, but sorghum will freeze at the first sign of frost. I think even a prediction of frost in the forecast, sorghum just wimps out and freezes. So, um, so it, does, it does terminate earlier than some of the other cover crops. Um, but using two pounds an acre is enough in a mix. Um, so you don't need any more than two pounds. Uh, you could bump it up a little bit if you want some water, some more water use, but usually two pounds is just about right for a, uh, for a mix with other species. Um, I wanted to show you some of the things that we've done on some small plots. Um, I think this was in 2014. And these are areas where we had some cover crop, different cover crop mixes that were seeded. And we had this um, light blue line, which is where we left it bare and we, we just kind of managed the weeds throughout the season and, and left it bare. So I want to look at water use by just having a cover crop mix out there and the benefits. Um, this most diverse mix actually used the most moisture evenly through the profile. And in that one, we had cereal rye, Dorfessix rapeseed, some sugar beet, um, sunflower, pea, and flax. 
And you know, all the cover crop mixes dry the soil profile out. A more diverse mix, I think you're getting different root structures into the soil and possibly drying out the soil more efficiently. Um, but look at what happens on a bare soil. If you're just gonna manage um, or prevent plant field with tillage, you, you, you evaporate moisture from the surface, but you never get rid of this bulge of moisture down at, at five inches or 10 inches, wherever that water is just being held that's creating such these soils that are basically putting underneath um, the dry surface. So, um, so it's really, I'm, I'm glad you guys are here on this, on this call because it means that you're thinking about managing the moisture in a different way um, than just using tillage and, and where it really isn't efficient at drying the profile out. Um, also for, for nitrogen uptake, it's really good. You can see all the cover crop mixes here on the left-hand side have, have captured some of the nitrate in, uh, whereas leaving it bare uh, leaves that nitrate in the soil available to leach. So it's a great way to capture it. We don't know when that becomes available, but it's, it's captured at least in, in the system. Um, this is what some of these diverse mixes look like um, after they've frozen, um, and this was in December. And so you can see that this is really not very different from something like, a, I think this is barley in that field, um, from barley stubble. So, um, so if you have concerns about all the biomass and the residue, uh, it really breaks down quite well. And these, these are almost just like little styrofoam radish that just break apart in your hand. They're, they're not uh, tough, they're not difficult. Um, so this is, is really not that much of an issue to, to seed into the following year. One of, the, one of the worst things that you could do is go in and work up a cover crop um, after it's grown for a full season. You see how all the radish and turnip were just brought to the surface. They don't decompose as well when they're, when they're tilled at the end of the season and left on the surface they actually decompose better in the soil. So, um, so don't get nervous at the end of the year and, and till it, just leave it in the soil, let it decompose and then direct seed into it the following year. Uh, there's a lot of questions about whether to use a mix or a monoculture. Um, so here on the left, we have a very diverse full season mix. And on the right, we have uh, more of a monoculture. There may be a few other things in here, but predominantly it's a grass. And it's good to, to think about what you need to do in that field and how you're gonna manage it. So if you have a lot of uh, weed pressure in a field and you feel like you're gonna need to spray something for broadleafs uh, throughout the growing season, then then seed just a grass um, and manage it that way. Get some competition, but leave yourself an opportunity to spray a herbicide. Um, if you're looking at your field is pretty clean and you wanna do a diverse mix, then, then go for it, but always start with a clean field. Um, don't seed cover crops into weeds because you'll just get cover crops and weeds. Um, so this is another diverse mix. 28 pounds an acre seeding rate, radish, turnip, sunflower, oats, and peas, uh, 20 bucks an acre. So I think this is definitely an option. Um, it's in kind of the right price range, but you can adjust the price ranges um, for what you're willing to spend on these acres. But take care of all your ruts, your ditching, anything you need to do um, prior to seeding a cover crop and, and just start with a weed-free field. Um, here is cereal rye. 40 to 50 pound per acre rate, 10 bucks an acre. Um, rye, if it, if it doesn't overwinter, so if you don't seed it in the fall with it overwintering, it doesn't vernalize. So it'll stay very low to the ground um, and provide a nice cover. So it's a great option for seeding early. Um, you won't, you'll get enough biomass, but not too much. Um, and it certainly, it's not gonna head out um, during, if it's seeded in the spring or midsummer. Um, I have a lot of tips down here. If you're going to use grasses, consider a mix of grasses like oats and barley. Um, cereal rye or winter rye is not an issue just to see by itself because you wouldn't have an opportunity to take it as a cash crop. Um, but, but I don't know if insurance would be concerned about having just oats because there's potential you could take it for, for grain. Um, but just you could just mix it up with some oats and barley. I guess that's a discussion with your insurance provider. Um, if you have a cover crop in the field and it's starting to head out. Um, say you have just just oats and it's starting to head out and you may want to terminate it. Um, you could also do that so you don't have have the seed production. Um, it also made it would change the residue that you have in that field. Um, <clears throat> once it heads out it gets kind of straw like but if it's um, if it's still kind of vegetative then it may be easier to plant into. But don't be scared to terminate it if you feel like the soil is going to get too dry and not replenish for next year. Um, say we just go into a drought or something like that. But, um, but there's lots of ways to manage it. And then also, uh, this is something I learned from Andrew Friskop when I had a question about um, what 
grass cover crop you could use prior to wheat or barley the following year. And Andrew was saying that oats are more favorable if you're going to use those on 2020 PP before 2021 wheat or barley crop because um, they're not as good of a host at scab and there may be some root rots that are possible. But um, but he thought that oats is a relatively low risk for grass prior to going to wheat or to barley. So that was kind of where we're getting new information each time that we include other specialists in the discussion. So um, so that's just to get the ideas ideas flowing. Um, we could certainly, if anyone wants to, um, I see a question already here from, from Fletch. Um, is there a sterile sorghum variety that we would not worry about reseeding? Mara saw that is a good question for you. Not that I know. <laughs> I don't think so. I never heard of a sterile rye. I don't know, Naeem, have you heard of that? I don't think so. I think it's a, a sterile sorghum variety. Well, sorghum, a lot of the varieties are uh, photoperiod sensitive since it's a short day plant. So it's not that they're sterile, it's just in this long days uh, environment, they just don't flower or flower so late, they never produce seed. Um, but a sterility would be that, you know, it just doesn't, the pollen sterile, I don't, I don't think we have something like that. I really don't think. If somebody knows, just let me know. <laughs> Um, let's see, we've got um, another question here. What are some good mixes to plant on 2020 PP and planting for corn in 2021? Um, so that would definitely be a scenario where you don't want to just use radish and turnips. Uh, like I mentioned before, you'd want something mycorrhizal in there, uh, which could be a legume, a grass. Um, flax is also pretty mycorrhizal. Um, I, you know, I've heard of issues if you have peas in that field um, prior to corn that some of that residue can get kind of wrapped around some of the row cleaners and things like that the following year. So you may want to stay, you know, if you use peas, you might want to plant them offset from where the rows are going to plant your corn um, so that they don't get caught up in your equipment. But you could, it's a great opportunity to build some nitrogen in that soil or increase efficiency of your microbes in that soil by having a legume. I think Marisol, you've done work where you need 60 days of, of fixation on a legume to get some nitrogen benefits. Is that right? So you definitely would have that in this situation. Yeah, um, yeah the thing is um, legumes are very good scavengers. So any nitrogen you already have, the legume first is going to use the nitrogen. So if you got a really deficient soil, they might uh, start fixing nitrogen right away. But if you have nitrogen in the soil, especially if you're in a PP and you already have fertilized and you have a lot of nitrogen, the legume is just gonna take up that nitrogen. It's free nitrogen. You know, nitrogen fixation is a process that requires a lot of energy for the plant. So if there's nitrogen available, it's not gonna do it. And so that's why uh, most legumes take time to start to use the nitrogen in the soil available first. And so it's about 60 days uh, that we've seen, but we've seen it earlier too. Some peas can start fixing in about 30 days of our range too. But like I said, it's going to depend on available nitrogen on the soil when nitrogen fixation kicks in. And I think if you, the grass that you may include in that, I think oats, I feel like that residue is, is easier to plant into. Um, with corn you may, um, I don't know if you have access to a strip till, machine or something like that, but you you may consider doing some strip till into it. Um, but I would stay away from anything that's going to overwinter um, on those fields, you know, I, I, specifically rye. I don't think I would put, I would include that because you're not going to want anything growing the next year when you're going to corn. Um, so I don't know, Dave, is that helpful? Is that just, you know, I think you could include a legume. Um, that would be beneficial. Um, but I would I would choose some residue that you're going to be comfortable planting into something like a like a oat residue, um, and you could put radish in there. I don't usually recommend turnips unless you're going to graze it, um, because radish and turnip kind of do the same thing, and and it's just easier um, easier to, to to have radish in the system than it is turnip. It, it winter kills better I think than turnip does. Um, Chris has a question: Before wheat or barley, would you suggest a forage oats? or a grain-based oats, or either will work just fine? Um, I, think, I think it depends upon the purpose. If 
if if one would want to graze, then forage oats would work better. But otherwise, to be honest with you, both are fine. Um, and oftentimes I've heard from a lot of producers that they have some seed, oats or barley, in their bins. So if, if they are not particularly uh, grazing, planning to graze, that should be fine. Uh, let's see. Oh, Greg, mate. Greg, did you want to ask a question? Um, let's see. I also see one here. Thoughts on beer seam clover um, since PP could be very early this year in Balanza. Um, Marisol, you know more about clovers than anybody. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, well, uh, we've tried clovers in different situations and, and somehow up in here they don't do very well. Um, so every time we've tried I guess you can put them in a mix, but uh, clovers are very sensitive to competition. So you have other plants in it, like you have sorghum or millets. It's not gonna do very well. For some reason, the clovers here grow very, very slow. The only one I've seen that does a little bit better on mixes is red clover, and then it might survive for next year. Um, but every time I plant Lercin, Balanza, Crimson, and I just haven't been very impressed. I'm not sure if we're doing it all wrong or what, but I've tried several times and it hasn't worked. But you can always try and put some in your mix and, and try to see how it does. Uh, but I'm, I'm not, you know, we, we don't have good results or science-based information to recommend these clovers for PP. Um, you, for PP, you want something to use a lot of water. And uh, those are usually the grasses like sorghum or millets that they're gonna grow fast and use a lot of water. Do you know cost-wise, and maybe Chris knows, um, cost-wise the difference between beer seam balanza and, and red clover? Um, I don't know if anyone has tested them and seen different. Uh, that would be nice information, but we, we've tried several times and we get very little, um, uh, the stands are poor and they, they well, maybe it could be too that you need to inoculate it for sure because I don't think we have the rhizobium for those clovers here. Uh, but we've inoculated them and still hasn't been that great. I'm not, you know, there's something we don't know yet why the clovers don't do well. Could be very heavy soils. I'm, I'm not sure. So as you far know, as our, our choice for a legume, probably peas would be be the number we one. We choose peas because they're cheap. And we know it works. Uh, a lot of people have, there's a lot of availability for field peas. You want to buy a forage pea, the forage pea will put a lot more biomass and will probably fix more nitrogen than the field pea, but you know, but it costs more too. So you have to balance both. The same with fava beans. Fava beans are great. I really like them because they fix a lot of nitrogen, but the seed is expensive for a mix. So it's all balancing, you know, what do you want, if you're gonna graze it or not. Like we've been saying, I am have saying many times, it, it's your choice depending on your operation. You know your farm, your soils better, much better than we know because we, 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 we're not there. So you are the one that can decide what really works for you. And you can always do some tests if, if you know, do a strip of something and see how it works on your soils and your condition. Like if you wanna try some Bersim or some Balanza, or other legume, you know, uh, you can always do, buy some seed and do a strip or a section. Just don't go on your whole farm with something you don't know how it's gonna work. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. And here, Chris is saying that it's roughly a buck a pound uh, for the clovers and um, beer seam clover is more expensive than mammoth red or, or medium red. So if you need to reduce costs then then going with the red clover sounds like a like a good choice. Yeah, like I said, you know, red clover is used for forage, so we've had it around a lot before the other clovers for cover crops. And, uh, and, and generally that's much better than the other ones. And I think it's because it's more adapted to and since it's been used for forage before. Uh, the only thing, uh, red clovers, um, clovers in general, like a lot of water. 
Uh, so that's another reason we don't grow so many clovers for forages either, because they like rain and that's not something we have too much of. <laughs> Some years we do, but uh, clovers, uh, clovers like water. <laughs> Okay, um, let's see. What benefits does flax bring to PP when planning for 2021 corn or soybeans? Um, I like flax in general. Um, I think it's a nice species to include in a mix. I feel like it's not difficult to manage. Um, and I like, also I've seen some really neat um, flax growing with peas, you know, where the peas will attach to the flax and they'll stay upright. And it's kind of a cool system that way. Um, you know, as far as I mean, we talk about flax being very mycorrhizal um, and good before corn, um, and it certainly is is mycorrhizal. But there are a lot of other species that are too. Um, so don't get hung up on that being, you know, including flax just to have have mycorrhizae in there to prime that soil for corn. So corn uses mycorrhizae mycorrhizal associations to to gather phosphorus. Um, so you want to prime that soil and make sure it's there before corn. Um, but I think I think you could certainly include flax. I think it's a great option to have in there with the grass and maybe with something um, with a deep tap root or something too. One thing of consideration, and like Abby, I really like flax too, is if you're gonna graze it, uh, be careful because if it has too much seed, if you got a lot of uh, flax and it goes to seed, which you might because it's fast, right? Um, uh, it can cause problems. You can't have, because the seeds have too much fat and that stops the rumen from functioning. Uh, so you have to watch if you have a big percentage of flax uh, with seeds and you're going to graze that so you could cause problems. So you have to watch for that if grazing is what you're going to do. If you're not going to do grazing, no worries, but if you plan to graze, uh, watch for that. Um, then here's a question on how many pounds of oats would you use in a mix? Um, Oh, I hate these pounds questions because I never know. I always depends. That's the best answer. Depends. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's where you can get some really you know on the grasses and things like that. That's where you can get some great great advice from the seed company where you purchase. Um, I don't know. We've got Colin and Chris on here. If you guys either of you want to want to make a recommendation of pounds of oats in a mix. I. I could only say that, for example, I went through your recommendation, Marisol, and on its own, um, oats, oat seeding rate would say 60, 60 pounds per acre. So say in the mix, if you want to have 30% oats, you just take 30% of 60 pounds, which will be, I'm not very good at math, so I'm just going to quickly do it. <laughs> I'm not so either. So say 18, 18 pounds, for example. <laughs> So I think what, what people need to do is to, based on their objectives, pick the crop species, take their full seeding rates. And then, for example, some crops are not, they do not compete well. Some suppress other crops growth. So then go with the best percent of that crop in the mix and then multiply it with the full seeding rate. And then you'll get the seeding rate. Perfect. Then we've got a question. This is a good one for you, Naeem. What, work, what do you find works best in saline areas? Um, oats, barley, sugar beet. The only catch is sugar beet is not really um, very, very good at competing with others. So you want to have a higher percentage of sugar beet in that mix. And then sweet clover, I found as a legume, is more salt tolerant than, say, peas or, you know, I've only tried sweet clover on saline area, so I cannot speak about bursine clover or red clover, but sweet clover. And I could actually quickly tell you guys um, what mix I use. So say, um, for example, and then you could go very simple too. You don't have to have four species. If you wanna have the cost down, I would just put either barley or oats with sugar beets. And I personally would go with 60% sugar beets in the mix, 40% barley or oats. So that's just a two-way mix. If you want to be a little bit more, you know, diverse, uh, you could add sweet clover. And if you want to be really 
you know, a diverse, then you could have four, like both barley, oats, sweet clover, and sugar beet. So in that mix, I had barley and oats at 20% in the mix, sweet clover 20%, and sugar beet 40%. Uh, I just wanted to have more sugar beet seed because they don't compete well. So I, these four crops to me are the best. Um, sweet clover is not as salt tolerant as the other three, but among legume, that's slightly more salt tolerant. So you have an option. I also wanna make a point, Abby, we talked about residue. Um, so if we have a balanced cover crop mix where there is a legume or crops with more N, that would balance the CN ratio and that would help break down the residue um, during the winter or fall or early spring. If we have only a cover crop mix, which have high carbon crops, that will take longer and you know it may create problems in terms of residue, managing residue. Um, Naeem, I just wanna add, you're right, the other clovers are super susceptible uh, to salinity. Actually, red clovers is used as a susceptible check when uh, in breeding programs for alfalfa, they just mm -hmm. put a red clover strip and so to check for salinity because they'll die with mm -hmm. pretty much any salinity. And mm -hmm. I don't know the other ones, but I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, it makes sense that they're very susceptible too. And sweet clover yeah. is one of the, it, it is more- It is a little one. bit. It's not the best one. No, you know. that's, that's better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you could use alfalfa uh, too. Alfalfa is-, is Actually, good. sweet clover is more salt tolerant than alfalfa. Yeah, yeah it is, but you can, some people are once they buy the alfalfa, uh, the salt tolerant alfalfas, which they're not super tolerant, but they're better than than the regular one. Mm -hmm. so. I I have my, <laughs> I like to ask people when they say that I like to ask them what up to what EC level. But what there's, I, uh, there's a company that has a mission. They say up to four EC. Okay. Uh, they'll do that's my, yeah. yeah, that's, that's been my observation too. Yeah. Uh, a four. four. And yeah, that's, but they're better, you know, regular alfalfa variety won't take even two, but uh, a salt oil and they're up to four. And I've seen studies where they have red clovers and susceptible varieties, and I could see the difference on the salt oil and to be a little better. I got some pictures I, I might send you where, where you can see the difference between a salt oil and, and non-salt oil and on a saline sip. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. that would be wonderful. Yeah. And so it sounds like, you know, Fletch is saying over here too, the annual uh, sweet clover is hard to find. And so maybe swapping out something like that with a, with alfalfa would be an option if, if you, yeah, if you want it to establish, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, is the seed companies know that? Is, is the sweet clover hard to find? Sweet clover seed? I don't know that. I never had a problem with sweet oh, clover mm -hmm. seed, right. personally speaking, so far. Colin or Chris, is do you have any problem sourcing sweet clover seed? And you guys are welcome to unmute too if you want. You don't have to just type in the chat box. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sweet yeah. clover seed is available. Um, so I see a question back here that I want to oh. And you'll see. Um, I want to get back to this question because this is one for Joe. Um, if seeding cover crops early in July, uh, should weeds be terminated mid-June or closer to when seeding? Cover crop insurance would allow seeding um, so many days after last seeding date with your regular drill. July 4th, sorry, I'm not, uh, I don't know all these things. Um, but yeah, Joe, herbicide applications, um, when do you terminate? And also, what effect does that have on some of the cover crops? Yeah, good question. Um, a lot of it will somewhat depend on what weeds are there. So if it's, you know, if you're in a no-till system and there's a lot of winter annual weeds that you find problematic every year, uh, there's a good chance of uh, they're going to go to seed in between now and early July. So in that case, if you want to reduce the, the seed bank of those weeds in future years, the earlier the better. 
Otherwise, if it's mainly summer annual weeds, I mean, they won't really go to seed between now and then, but they will also be growing. And so if they're relatively easy to control, if, if it's glyphosate susceptible for the most part, and you're just going to use something like Roundup uh, for your termination, then you can wait. They're going to use up some of that water as well on, on those acres. Um, more difficult to control weeds if they're growing fast, and they're going to be more difficult to control if they're bigger. So again, earlier the better. And the other thing will really depend on what, if any, residual herbicides, even ones we don't typically think of having residual, like 2,4-D, which does have some. Um, I, you'd have a high risk of injury to some crops if you wait until uh, right before planting. Um, that being said, there's, you know, we get these questions every year, whether it's PP or otherwise, of spray something like two or three ounces of dicamba, how long until I can plant this? And it's kind of always a depends, but in general, crop labels are more conservative than something that's not technically a crop, such as cover crops. Um, so, you know, you could have a little bit of, uh, could have a little bit of injury, but otherwise the, the cover, the covers here probably would grow out of it. Looks like he's thinking about AIM, so yeah, in that case, wouldn't really have residual. Um, also Paraquat as well, another great option. Um, if weeds were larger by waiting a couple weeks, Paraquat would be my choice over AIM, just based on weed size. But certainly if you're in a position to, to wait and you have the options to, I, I don't see too much of an issue with waiting. Um, like I said, if nothing else, the weeds will use up some of that water. The question is with kochia, well, that's a that's a good couple week window there for kochia to grow. So uh, my preference would be to get out there as soon as possible to uh, control kochia when it's smaller. Just just the bigger it gets, the more difficult it will be. Um, again, it's it's going to depend on on particular driver weeds in the field. Could be a more of a field by field basis. On, on what's best. That's kind of some general comments that I have. So Joe, we had that question earlier about um, where they had cereal rye that was growing through this year and that field is, is gonna be PP and they have some drown outs. Um, I mean, I, I suppose broadcasting radish in some of those drownout areas would would handle some of the weed pressures, or what would you recommend for that? Maybe a herbicide pass over it to control weeds in those drownout areas? It would depend on how drown out they are. If it's still <laughs> wet, then there's, uh, you know, there may not be a whole lot of weeds there at the moment anyways. Um, or there may even weeds, and now it's underwater, depending on how much rain there was. Um, in general, I, 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 I haven't seen enough good data on radish competition with weeds to be uh, confident in making that recommendation of a radish. I mean, it'll be some competition, but there's certainly more competitive species. Um, in, in that case, if it's a drown out area that somehow doesn't have standing water right now, then you know herbicide would be a decent choice for those areas, especially if you have a you know, small four-wheeler sprayer that you can get around those areas pretty easily. Do you know of any cover crops that could be broadcast in those areas that would be more competitive or? I suppose it all depends on what you have in the rest of the field too. It does, and I, I don't know depending on how wet it is, which ones would be competitive in a wet environment versus dry, as far as the cover crops. You know, Abby, if those areas are consistently wet every year and people want to have uh, trafficability, I would suggest that just plant a perennial grass mix. And again, uh, when I talk about perennials, not all perennials are salt tolerant. Some are very salt tolerant, some are not. But if salinity is not an issue, they could go and plant any perennial 
just keep it mowed and they will have, I can tell you this, here at the center, we have this perennial mix growing on one of the lowest areas, one of the most, you know, saline sodic areas and um, good land, our people till, and it's like a mud puddle off the rain, but when you drive on the grass, you're just driving on the paved road. So if that's, that's the option, you cannot really plant those grasses when there is a standing water, seed will not germinate, so you will have to wait for a good time. But once they germinate and establish, uh, they will use up a lot of water and they will provide the trafficability. And, it, and they're perennial, so you don't need to replant them. Okay, let's see, we have another question that came up here. Um, PP ground that is salty and wet, that is going to corn in 2021, had thoughts on using radish, turnip, sunflower, barley, or rye mix. But I'm concerned that the barley or rye would have to be terminated too early to get the full benefit of the others. Um, okay, so radish, turnip, sunflower, barley, or rye. Um, just my thought on a mix. Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, I also have intentions of spreading P and K needs for the corn the same time as spreading the cover crop seed just to keep the cost down and pay for one application. So any thoughts or concerns on that? Well, number one, if it is a salty ground, I would not put turnip and radish there. That's number one point. Number second point, barley is good. Uh, and Again, when we say salty, I mean, corn is not really a salt tolerant crop either. So if you are able to grow corn there, I would assume your soil EC is at most three, three and a half, for example. So you may be able to plant rye and barley too. And applying fertilizer this year for next year's crop, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't deal with fertility but I've worked in Pakistan for a fertilizer company. I don't know how much of that phosphorus would be available next year to corn. You may want to save some money on application cost, but if, if you if some phosphorus is fixed in your soil, you know, it's just, uh, I, would, I would definitely consult Dave friends and our people like him on this, but um, I would question that and, you know, if fertility people say this is okay, then I would do that. So I think, you know, on, so if it's really wet, I'm, I'm guessing the whole field isn't salty. They're probably patches, um, you know, or if it's really wet, then having some sorghum in there might be a good fit because it can use a lot of moisture. Um, and I've done that before on some, you know, where I have a saline headland, but then the rest of the field is, is kind of okay. And I'll put sorghum in there just to use a lot of moisture because the field that we're working with where we've done that is just so wet all the time. And we really wanted to dry it out. Um, so sorghum was, was, a good, was a good fit for that. Um, yeah, I can't, you know, radish and turnips, I mean, yeah, they're not super salt tolerant, but they may grow in other areas that are not um, affected by salts. And in that case, I would maybe you know, I think you could use both in a mix. Um, I'd be concerned on that field. Uh, it's a good thing you're going to corn next year. Um, if you were going to go to soybean or something, I would leave, definitely leave the turnips out because those will get stuck on your, uh, anything that overwinters will get stuck on your equipment. Um, I've had some luck with Dorf, Dwarf Essex rapeseed in some of those areas too. Um, and maybe you would just do Dwarf Essex instead of the turnips. And so radish, Dwarf Essex, sunflower, uh, barley, and that may be a good a good fit, um, but if you have canola in rotation, I don't know if you're in, in canola country, Lucas. But if you do, I would I would not um, I would stay away from the brassicas in general, just because of the club root issues. Um, and I can certainly I can ask uh, we can ask Dave about the P and K needs and um, broadcasting that unless somebody that's on this call has some experience uh, with that and whether the cover crops would would take that up. For root crops, Abby. Beets can also um, mm -hmm. be better um, if you want it. If you cannot have turnip and radish and beets, last call, um, I got cl uh, clarification for Marisol. So sugar beet has no, it's not a house for club root. So you have a good option. It's very salt tolerant. So if you want to have a root crop, that would be a good option too. Um. 
Um, let's see another question on um, how flat you like annual ryegrass, which you say we don't recommend, which is correct because Joe Joe does not like it. Uh, yeah, I've I've seen it work in some areas, um, but honestly, um, yeah, annual ryegrass could be could be great, but I think you for sure need some cattle in there to help manage it, um, and I can't recommend it just because Joe will punch me in the face. So, <laughs> so I won't recommend annual ryegrass. Um, but you have a question about Japanese millet supplying oxygen to roots and low and tight soils. Green cover crops uh, mentions this. I don't know, Marisol, what do you think? Uh, I, I need you to throw that one to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't have any information that us, and I don't know if uh, there's science-based information that does that. Japanese millet, I like it because it grows more than other millets. Uh, Stoller produces more biomass, it's a good forage, but uh, it supplies oxygen to, to roots. I don't know, I never heard of that. And like all the grasses, it has a you know fibrous rooting system, uh, but Supplying oxygen. I never heard of that before, so I don't know uh, where, if, if there is a science paper that says that, I'd love to see it. The only way um, soils get uh, oxygen is through the porous space. If you improve the porous space, that comes from soil particle aggregation. Some plants have roots which create channels for water and air to move, but that's going to take some time to, plants directly do not supply plant roots respire, they take oxygen, whatever is already there in the soil. Um, okay, let's see, we've got another question. I used oats, barley, millet, and winter rye last year. It got hayed and the rye got about 18 inches tall before planting soybeans this year. The rye was on the thin side and did not cause problems. I sprayed it off right after planting and the soybeans are doing well. Oh, that's great. That's a nice, that's a nice mix and um, yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing. I don't know if there's, um, Joe, do you know of any work on stands of rye and weed competition? I mean, do thin stands do just as well as thick stands or, you know, do we need to adjust our seeding rates for that? Not anything in the weed science literature, at least. Uh, several of my colleagues and also myself are kind of working on questions like that in the upcoming years, um, but you know, no, nothing replicated on, especially we would probably put it on a very weedy patch to really tease out any differences. Um, yeah, no, nothing I'm aware of except for anecdotal stuff, which I, I try not to push anecdotal stuff too much until I have better answers. Yeah, that's kind of where I've, I've gotten, I, well, I had a voicemail from Steve Zwinger up at Carrington about um, uh, some of the competition in his stands of rye with weeds. Um, and it's just kind of observation stuff right now, but but that's good. I'm glad in this situation that that rye, you know, did overwinter and, and you got some use out of it in the spring for planting beans into it. Um, So now my question for, for Greg, who, who put that in there was, um, you know, some of the fields that had rye in it, they were still just really wet underneath. And I don't know if you, if you experienced that on your fields or, <clears throat> or if the rye got rooted down deep enough where it was, where it was using a lot of that lower uh, moisture in the profile. Well, I unmuted here, if that's okay. Ah, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, I did use some of that moisture. And um, right next to the water sloughs, they, you know, it still wasn't great. But I th away from that, 20 feet out or, or, and, and beyond, it, it seemed like the soil was uh, um, pretty friendly for planting. So that was good. But I did have some, some areas that didn't get hayed, and that wasn't as friendly because there was a lot of trash there for the planter to try and get through, and it, it did not dry out quite as nice there. So do you think would there be anything in that mix then that like say you couldn't hit or that wasn't something you're going to do um, that you would have dropped out that you that you feel like had more biomass than some of the others? 
I like the I like the biomass. I thought it was uh, pretty good that way. I I noticed in my salty areas, I, I didn't get a lot of millet and oat growth, um, um, or rye for that matter. It was mostly just kind of the barley, and and some of those areas didn't even get hay because of that. They were pretty wet last fall when it came time for doing that. Uh, also, and uh, they got left. But uh, like I said, the, the barley was about the only component that really did well there. So. That's good. Um, uh, Marisol, would you, um, you know, in these mixes, so I, I tend to, I just go for a lot of the cool season grasses. Um, do you think including, you know, that millet component or warm season grass is pretty critical for, for prevent plant situations? Yeah, um, well, I always, for PP, I think uh, you have to have something that moves water. You know, that's the reason you're doing PP. So um, millet sorghums are going to do that much faster than uh, the cool season grasses like barley or oats. That's during the summer. Now, winter rye is good in the mix because you want it to move water in the spring, right? If you still have a lot of excess water in the spring. So, um, but it, during the summer, when you want to try to get uh, as much water out of the soil as possible, millet and sorghum is what I like to see there because that's what's going to move water. Remember the water moves through the roots, roots of the plant, through the plant to the air. You know, what we lose through evaporation directly from the soil to the air is minimal compared to what the plants can move. That's why soil without plants takes a long time to dry, right? And then it moves salts up too. So I think uh, having a crops that move water fast uh, is, is, is key for a PP ground. Did I answer? <laughs> the question. Yeah, no, that's good because I, I, I sometimes I forget about including a millet in there or something else, um, especially on PP, and that that is a good point. Are there any? Um, I mean, we have all these cool season broadleaf uh, plants that we use in a mix. Are there any warm season broadleaf that you would recommend um, if somebody wanted a little more diversity and and something warm season in there? Well, uh, you know, of the warm seasons, say you want if you're going to have a carbon fall season, they move some water or those that produce a lot of biomass. And one would be sunflower. You know, you don't want to put too much in the mix, but you want to have some sunflowers with that deep tap root will move water. Um, the other one um, that works, but it works only if you inoculate it, it would be sun hemp. Sun hemp can grow a lot in the heat of the summer, but it needs to be inoculated with the right resolvium, otherwise it's just going to turn yellow and do much. The, they won't do much. So those two I like to see. I know sand hemp is kind of expensive and that's why we don't use it much. Um, but I think uh, here throwing maybe a pound of sunflower into the mix, it will help to move some. And I've seen several of, of you already are considering sunflower and I know I uh, recommends it too. Uh, just don't want to go with too many of them, but if you want to put some of them, I think that'll help with water. So we've got a, a mix here of using a sorghum, sugar beet, sunflower mix. Um, what would be a good seeding rate and how many pounds <laughs> each? They really want wants us to do that, uh, do the seeding <laughs> rate. <laughs> I was, Marisol, I was going through your list and on its own, you recommended um, sorghum soot on grass 30 pounds per acre. Yeah. Um, and Sugar beets, we have played with that five to eight pounds yeah. per acre on its own. Would you agree with that? On its own, yeah. Five. But uh, on its own. No, like okay. I don't recommend plant monocultures, <laughs> but yeah. if you're yeah. just gonna plant well, that, I'm just, it will be okay. I'm just taking that as a basis to, a base. yeah. you know. And then uh, uh, sunflowers, what would be on its own seeding rate, for example? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Because I was thinking to answer his question, yeah. I would put 40 to 50 percent sugar beet in that mix. And if we say eight pounds per acre multiplied by, say, 50 uh, percent, that would be four pounds of sugar beet seed. Yeah. And if there's uh, 25 percent sorghum in this, 30 pounds of sorghum on its own multiplied by 25 percent, that would be seven and a half pounds. Yeah. I, I don't know what would be the full seeding rate for, if anybody could answer that, 
then we could just say 25% sunflower because you mentioned you don't want to have too much sunflower. So 50% yeah. wheat. Yeah, I don't, you know, I think for certain species, the percentage rate works, but not for all of them. Okay, uh, I think uh, some of them, like sunflower, you don't want to put more than one or two pounds. And it doesn't okay. matter the percentage you want. It's because you don't, just don't want, it's, it's not really a good cover crop. And especially if you're on a grazer, you don't want too many because of the fat problem, just like with flax. And the same, you know, some, I think some of the smaller seeds too, you don't want to divide in a percentage because if somebody, if something has a rate of five pounds, you divide it by 20, you know, 25, you're going to end up with too little. So the size of the plants doesn't really match the percentage of size of the seeds, <laughs> right? So okay. that's why I think in sunflower, when, when I see it in a mix, we usually put one pound okay. or less. Uh, usually sugar beet, I don't know much about sugar beet because I don't know if there is cheap sugar beet available. See, the product, sugar beet seed is an expensive thing to put in there, unless you found these uh, multi-germ old sugar beet varieties. Uh, uh, but I don't know, is there is there sugar beet for cover crops available that is not at the price of a sugar beet crop? Um, because I, I wouldn't recommend to use a, you know, coated, monogerm, expensive seed. That would be too expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's why I, I don't know, Naeem. I know you you like sugar bean. I, I like it too, especially for salinity, but I don't know the availability. Is any of the seed companies here can can say there's any, if there is sugar bean, the, the cover crop type or monogerm, all varieties, not the certified varieties for crop. Do you guys sell any sugar beet that is not for the crop? You know, Naeem, who provides sugar beet? I seed? have bought the a mix from Agassiz. I bought it from Reward Seeds. I bought them from Pulse USA. I've never had a, a time when I was told that that was not available. Chris, is, is that seed on, on the mixes that you have? Is a uh, multi germ? The old varieties? See, I don't I don't know much about that. It's just I just wondered about the cost of sugar beet seed. But my guess is you're gonna put lower rates too, like not maybe more than two pounds. And with sorghum too, um, with sorghum, sorghum you have to watch it because sorghum can become very competitive and pretty much smother everything else on the mix. If you're putting a mix, it's because you want all the plants to be there, right? Uh, not to put it and never see them. And we've seen, we, we have a student doing a, a thesis on this and um, with more than two pounds, uh, pounds per acre of sorghum, you're gonna cause so much competition. Even with that all, in all the mixes, we end up with 70% of the biomass was sorghum, right? So, so, and a lot of people put five or 10 pounds, you put five or 10 pounds of sorghum, that's all you're gonna get is sorghum. So in these PP mixtures, if, if diversity is what you want, you gotta really watch the rates of these competitive species. So for sorghum, I don't like much more than two pounds per acre if you want the rest of the species be there. And that's kind of, I, I guess I have this like two, it's a two pound rule of thumb and I don't, it doesn't work for everything, but it seems like a lot of, a lot of different cover crop species it, it kind of works with. So, you know, radish and turnip, you wouldn't want more than two pounds. You know, sunflower is probably not more than two pounds. Sorghum, not more than two pounds. Um, and I'm trying to think of what else, you know, you'd, you'd want probably flax to be less than, than two pounds for sure. Um, I don't know, I guess I've seen too many fields where they get five to six pounds of things like like radish and turnip and uh, you know one one field I saw had like five pounds of radish, five pounds of turnip and it was just it, it was then none of them grew. I mean there was way too there was just too much there and it was all kind of yellow and you know just it didn't it, it was expensive I'm sure you know five pounds of each of those gets kind of costly. Um, but that's where too, if you're looking at a mix and you want to reduce the cost, you just reduce some of the seeding rates too. You know, some of those you want good coverage, but you can you can play around with the seeding rates to reduce the cost as well. Um, let's see, Lucas also asked, uh, what kind of sorghum, grain or forage? No intentions of haying or grazing. 
Well, like a, if you're just using the sorghum, try to find it like a sorghum sedan type. And most of, yeah, it's not, uh, I wouldn't use a grain one because the grain sorghum is very short and it will produce seed and you get a lot of seed in the ground. Um, and so you, you could use a forage type sorghum sedan hybrid or just straight forage sorghum because those are the ones that are gonna move a lot of the water out of the soil. I wouldn't put a grain sorghum for PPE. Good deal. Um, thoughts on vetches? <clears throat> I can tell you I'm not a huge fan of hairy vetch. I don't think I keep that a secret. Um, common vetch I've used before and it's been okay. Um, I think there are better legumes. Honestly, I, I, I like peas better than vetches. Um, I, yeah, I just, I never use hairy vetch, so that's what I do stay away from. Um, yeah, we, the problems with hairy vetch is sometimes um, it overwinters. And if it overwinters, then and it produces seed. If you get a vetch to go seed, you'll never get rid of the seeing vetch the rest of your life. <laughs> because once it has dormancy, and so if a, a plant produces seed, you always see it almost every year. And it can be a problem with, uh, and Joe may say more about this because vetches uh, crawl, you know, they have these tendrils, so they crawl up the plants like sunflowers or wheat, and they're difficult to control. So that's the main reason we don't like it. Like Abby says, you can get all the benefits you need from a legume, from a pea, so you don't really need the hair vetch. Uh, I know a lot of people use it, but uh, it can become uh, a weed problem. And I don't know if it's because it's hard to control or because of the seed on my seed. Joe, maybe you can say that, but I've seen fields where they have hair vetch and once they had it, they every year you'll see plants with hair vetch coming up. <laughs> yeah, it's got a hard seed coat and dormancy issues. And so that's why yeah, if it overwinters one year and goes to seed, then it's it's a problem in that field for future years. So my preference would be something else, especially if you're, you know, saying that you can get the same benefits agronomically or soil health wise as peas, then I'd certainly try to stay away from vetches just for that reason, you know. So I see another question here on TEF grass, um, broadcasting it on at a 12 pound per acre rate with or with an air drill at 10 pounds per acre um, putting it on ground that wasn't able to get planted due to wet wetness and they plan to hay it for cattle um, you know the one thing i know about tough grass and the farmers that i've worked with that have grown it it basically it needs to be seeded into basically a basketball court um, so it's it needs a very hard soil it needs to be very shallow um, what do they use like a brilliant seeder is that is that the type of cedar that you'd use? And you pretty much have to put it on the surface. Tef grass is so small seed um, that uh, it needs, that you put it just, uh, I don't know, half an inch deep and it won't come up. <laughs> now, it is a great grass as a quality for forage. And that's why people like it. It is it's one of the preferred forages for like horses too. It's, it's excellent digestibility, quality, it's really nice. But again, for me, for like a PP, I think, uh, especially you put in a mix, it's a waste because it won't compete with anything. So you put teff on a mix with millet or sorghum, you'll never see that. I've seen farmers, they put teff in the mix and we could never find one plant of teff. <laughs> and so in, it's not that cheap of a seed either. And so I think if, if your purpose is haying, you want a high quality hay or uh, forage for grazing, teff is a great choice for that. But you have to be aware that you need to to establish it on really well prepared seed bed and very shallow to make it. Farmers are already growing teff; they kind of they kind of master how to do it, and they can get a good establishment every year. I haven't been able to do that. <laughs> every time I, you know, I, I think I, out of five times I try, only one came up. <laughs> Probably put it too deep. I don't know. Uh, it's control seed depth and middle depth. I think it's a great forage. It's, it's one of the best quality, warm season quality forages that we have. So I've got another question. Uh, we're going to broadcast a bushel of cereal rye and incorporate it. Uh, when would be the best time to do this and not get competition from weeds before freeze up? So Joe, any thoughts on that? Yeah. 
Well, I guess, again, with the weeds you're dealing with. So we do have a rye table in the weed guide. So that would all be products labeled for rye that was going to seed. So they're safe enough to use those. Again, with broadleaf weed pressure, we have options there. But I, I think as far as the timing of sear rye, for me, it would be more about the overwintering um, issue. You know, if you plant it too early and it tillers too much, do you potentially lose stand over winter if that's your goal? Um, yeah, but from the wheat side, it's just sear rye. I'm not terribly worried about it unless you're put in a field with some major wild oat or foxtail issues with resistance. And if those are the weeds, then later the better since they germinate earlier in the season. Is this on um, is this on ground that is was 2019 corn that's going to be harvested and then um, putting the rye out there after harvest and you can unmute yourself too if you want if you want to talk about it. Yeah, 2019 corn. Okay. So yeah, I guess once you get the corn off, then then probably some with some good herbicide passes. I know I, I just saw an article about how some of the weeds in, in 2019 standing corn, hoping not to spray. Um, I think it was just an article in Ag Week that Greg LaPlante was talking about some of the um, some of the weed pressures coming up in, in 2019 corn that hasn't been harvested yet. I don't know, Joe, do you have some thoughts on that? Or are those, you know, there's not a lot of canopy to compete. No, so weeds are growing there. I mean, depending on how wet it is when you harvest the corn, you could stand a chance to rip a lot of the weeds out with your tires. Um, if the rye is going to be incorporated, then I guess that would depend if you're already going to cultivate once, if you hit it before and then incorporate, or the incorporation will also, you know, should uproot some of the smaller weeds. It really depends on what weeds are there and and how well established they are. Okay, so one tillage pass will be done before spreading the rye and then working again. In that case, the weeds that are there should be more or less okay um, as far as control. And it'll just be what whatever weeds would potentially come up afterwards. And like I said, we, we do have some options if it's straight zero rye. So would we have, so say you're, if, if you're seeding cereal rye midsummer, I mean, I'm guessing because it's a cool season, it's going to be a little slower to grow. Is it going to be as competitive with the weeds at that point? Or would it be, you know, what would it be better to put something else there that a warm season that would grow faster and then come back in with a rye and, and seed it into that? One yeah. comment. Sorry, go ahead, Joe. Oh, I mean, if, it, if it's solely weed suppression, then the more competition, the better. And so, but I'm, I'm guessing this is already, it's already 2019 corn prevent plant this year and want to put minimal amount of, you know, money and effort into that field. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing here the idea is just to get the rye in and then hopefully, you know, leave it. Um, and it, it will be, less competitive but um like i said at this point if it's later in the year i'd you know broadleaf weeds would be the more prevalent ones growing quickly in, in those areas and and we have options for those if, if a sprayer pass did have to be made perfect so abby i i wanted to comment on lucas's question about what should be the seeding rate for oats on its own. It could be 40 to 50 pounds if it's just a cover crop. But I just wanted to tell him and other people that if he planted oats, and I'm quoting the um, you know guy, uh, there's a handbook for cover crop and PP acres. If he planted that after the late planting period, and if he harvested those oats for grain, he could still get 35% of his PP payments. So the key thing is 
he has to plant the oats after the late planting periods. So generally, if your last planting date, final planting date, you know, once that comes, then you have to wait for the late planting period. And it ranges from 15 to 25 days, depending upon the crop in the county. Well, and it looks like he's asking too some questions about um, what else could go in with the oats. And I guess it would depend on your, on your uh, 2021 crop um, as to what you're gonna have out there. Because we certainly don't wanna recommend anything that would cause an issue in the following year's crop. Um, let's see, let's see, you follow up with also on PP ground going to soybeans next year, thinking of using just straight barley and, and how many pounds would you put on there? Um, so I worked with a, a farmer down south who was doing the same thing. He had barley on some PP ground last year and he was going to soybeans this year. And I'm trying to think of how much he put out there. He had some stuff in the mix though too. I think he, he did put some peas in there and actually, um, on the ground where he had the peas, where they where they established well, um, he said that the residue was so much better. That barley residue was really mellow and easy to plant into where he had some of the peas growing, uh, versus just where he had the barley stands and the peas. He put them too deep or something like that. They didn't grow in some areas. Um, so it may be maybe worth it, you know, depending on cost and what you want to spend um, to throw something in there like that that may may help with some of that residue. I don't know if you're a your system's no-till or full tillage or what you're used to planting into, um, but it may be an option to throw something else in there like that. Um, let's see, we have another question here. I have a whole field of dry beans that were not harvested. I plan to use a salford and perhaps roll it to, and seed a cover crop since, it, since that would be okay with crop insurance. I could broadcast something with it. I'm thinking radish and a grass, so disease pressure would be less uh, pea replacement, I guess. So yeah, if you're gonna broadcast, doing large seeds like peas are, are not a good fit. Um, any, you know, I mean, pea seeds, large, sunflower seed, anything that, that's a large seed, if you're gonna broadcast it and then lightly incorporate it, I think that, that, that you maybe wanna stay away from some of those larger seeds. Um, so Salford wouldn't get any more than two inches deep as far as, is running that tillage, um, or that vertical tillage. What what are you going to on that field in next year? So the dry beans weren't harvested. <clears throat> so I'm guessing in some of those dry beans, you probably had some shatter too, and so you're gonna get some volunteers coming back um, with the dry beans. And it'll probably get all volunteers unless any, unless they rotted over the winter, so. Okay, so then in that case, you already have your legume as part of the mix, right? I mean, you're gonna have the volunteer dry beans. I think that's what he may have meant by pea replacement, I guess. Oh, okay. So yeah, so broadcasting something with it, roll it and see the cover. So then I guess, you know, um, yeah, maybe that's that's all you need. I guess depending on, unless you're concerned about disease carryover, having, you know, dry beans last year and then having dry beans as a, as a cover crop this year. Um, you may for coverage just, you know, could you broadcast something like oats or something off, gosh, your seeding rate, would, you'd, have, you'd be filling that bin all the time if you're, if you're using something out of Salford where you're broadcasting at the same time, so you probably want a smaller seed. Um, but I would I would put a grass with it just for the coverage, I think. Um, and also too, I just really like fibrous roots. You know, I, I don't think of, of dry beans as having really great root systems, but I think of, um, you know, stuff like like Aaron Day, when he's talking about compaction and, and building soil structure and, and managing some of the, you know, some of the compaction from the ruts this past year in fields that, that oats are really one of the best options. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the radish and, and how that breaks up compaction, but fibrous roots can be just as good, good for that and also using moisture. Um, 
So I would maybe try, I'd try to broadcast something like a grass with that to come up with your volunteer drivings. Um, it's my gut instinct, but I don't know if anybody else has some thoughts on that. I actually agree with you. So yeah, so if you can create a system on that, I don't know if you have a, a some kind of um, box or something on that Salford where you can broadcast a cover crop seed at the same time you're you're running the Salford if you're just going to run over and, and broadcast first and then run the Salford, but um, no separate pass. So I guess it just depends on how often you want to fill the fill the seed box. But yeah, I can see not wanting to do a bunch of passes this year. You know, it doesn't make a lot of sense on some of this ground to, to double up on things if you can do it all in one pass. Um, so then, yeah, I guess I would just try to choose a small seed. I don't know if there's some grass seeds that are smaller than others. Um, so I could fill the no-till drill and lock them lock them in air and broadcast perhaps since it's not a normal seating for crop insurance purposes. Yeah, I suppose you guys have some constraints with crop insurance as well. But yeah, that's that's what I would do, especially I would think, you know, too, with some, uh, um, I don't know if, if having back-to-back -back dry beans would create more disease pressures in those fields too. Um, but trying to get something else in there to make it a divert more a little bit more of a diverse mix, just adding some kind of grass, and you probably could put a radish out there too. I know I think I think you kind of stay away from turnips um, just because of the having the the dry beans. I want to stay away from turnips. So, probably be good to write that one down to ask Markel his yeah. thoughts. Yeah, because I don't think you're the only person that has fields of dry beans out there that are going to be volunteering and and using as a cover. But yeah, I would I would try to get a grass in there just because I think you're going to get more roots and you're going to get better moisture use. Um, but we could certainly talk about it later too. I think um, if this is who I think it is, I think you have my phone number so you can give me a call and we can talk about it. So yeah, the Salford would fill in the sprayer ruts a little bit. Yeah, and I think that's a... You know, I mean, even in these no-till systems, when you have ruts and things like that, you've got to repair them. Otherwise, you're going to be dealing with them the next however many years. So, so I don't think there's, you know, I, I would, I would take care of the ruts with the light pass, um, with the Salford or something, and create a good seed bed and and really set yourself up well for next year. So we've got about ten minutes left on this call. I don't know if there's. Um, any other burning questions? I'm really excited about this chat box. You guys have asked a ton of questions over here. So thank you um, for doing that. Well, we do have an opportunity too for, um, we have this new podcast series starting on Monday called um, Soil Sense Field Check. And it's basically a question and answer type thing. So we've got the first couple episodes uh, filled up with, um, with questions being asked and then we find the specialist to answer it. So it's really easy if you go to ndfieldcheck.com um, you can record a question just like you're leaving a voicemail. And then um, then we'll take that question and I find the different specialists to answer the question. So like the first one, Joe's answering a question uh, that was that was put out there about um, about weed, weed control and using cover crops. And then the next week is Andrew Friscop's gonna answer a question about some of the disease transfer between cover crops and cash crops. Um, so if you have questions that you wanna ask, um, certainly record them there and even if they don't make the episode I've, I will find somebody to answer that question for you. Um, oh, Adam Adam just put in the chat box a hint to cover crop seed companies do more mixes without turnip. <laughs> so that's I think that's a good tip. I'm not a huge fan of turnip unless you're going to graze it and I know you're not getting cows anytime soon Adam so <laughs> so no turnips. Um, so yeah, I mean, we'll be, we have two more weeks of this. So if there are things you think of between now and, and next week, um, hop back on. And, and honestly, if you, if you get on early on the call, you can certainly just, I think most of us are on even 15 minutes before the, before the scheduled time. So you can, um, hop on and ask a question real quick if you need to, or whatever else we're usually just, just chit chatting before we start. So, um, 
All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining, and um, I'm glad glad we had this good discussion this morning. And yeah, just join us next week if you have more questions. Thank <music> you.